let us begin. And thanks for coming. This is Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Chapter 21. The Shadows Go Their Way. Got to figure out a better setup here. Hey, Larissa, how are you? Okay, now here we go. Chapter 21. The Shadows Go Their Way. Oleg was lucky enough to bump into her right in the doorway of the clinic. Moving to one side, he held the door open for her. She was walking so vigorously, her body bent slightly forward, that if he hadn't moved aside, she might well have knocked him down. He took in the whole picture at a glance. The blue beret on her dark brown hair, her head bowed as if she were walking against the wind, and her coat with its very individual cut. It had a fantastic long scarf-like collar, buttoned to the throat. Had he known she was Rusanov's daughter, he probably would have turned back. But as it was, he walked on to take his usual stroll along the unfrequented paths. Aviet had no trouble in getting permission to go upstairs to the ward. Her father was very weak, and in any case, Thursday was visiting day. Taking off her overcoat, she threw over her claret-colored sweater, the white coat they gave her, which was so small that she would only have been able to get her arms into the sleeves if she had been a child. After his third injection the day before, Pavel Nikolaevich had grown much weaker and no longer felt like taking his legs from under the blankets unless he had to. He moved about in bed very little, ate with reluctance, and didn't put on his glasses or butt in on conversations. The life around him, to which he normally reacted decisively, with approval or censure, had faded. He had become indifferent to it. His customary strength of will had been shaken, and he had surrounded to his weakness with a kind of pleasure. It was the wrong kind of pleasure, such as it is felt by a man who is freezing to death and powerless to move. The tumor, which had begun by annoying him, then frightening him, had now acquired rights of its own. It was no longer he but the tumor that was in charge. Knowing that Aviet had flown in from Moscow, Pavel Nikolaevich was expecting her. As always, he was waiting for her with joy. But this morning, the joy was mixed with alarm. It had been decided that Kappa should tell her about Minai's letter and the whole truth about Rodishev and Guzan. There'd been no point in her knowing before, but now her brains and her advice was needed. Aviet was a very clever girl whose views on things were at least as bright as her parents's, usually brighter. Still, it was rather alarming. How would she react? Would she be able to put herself back in time into their position and understand? Mightn't she condemn them, thoughtlessly, out of hand? In spite of the heavy bag she was carrying in one hand, and the white coat she was holding around her shoulder with the other, Aviat strode energetically into the ward, her head still bent as if against the wind. Her fresh, young face was glowing. It registered none of the pious compassion with which people usually approach the beds of the gravely ill, an expression Pavel Nikolaevich would have been hurt to see on his daughter's face. Well, father, how are things, eh? How are things? She greeted him brightly, sitting down beside him on the bed. Without forcing herself, she kissed him sincerely, first on one stale, stubbly cheek, then on the other. Well, how are you this morning? Tell me exactly how you feel. Come on, tell me. 
Pavel Nikolaevich's strength seemed to revive at her glowing appearance and her cheerful questioning. He rallied a little, well, how shall I put it? His voice was weak and measured, as if he were explaining it to himself. I don't really think it's gone down, no, but I do get the impression I can move my head a little more freely. There's less pressure, if you know what I mean. Without asking her father's permission, she opened his collar without causing him the least pain and peered at the tumor on his neck as if she were a doctor making a daily inspection. There's nothing terrible about that, she declared. It's a swollen gland, that's all. The way Mother wrote, I thought, goodness, you say you can move your head more freely, do you? That means injections are working. It definitely does. Later on, it'll get smaller. Once it's half the size it is now, I won't bother you so much. You'll be able to leave the hospital. Yes, you're right, Pavel Nikolaevich sighed. If it was only half the size, I could live with it, couldn't I? You could be treated at home. Do you think I could have the injections at home? I don't see why not. You'll get used to them. You'll get into the way of them. And I'm sure you'll be able to continue them at home. We'll talk about it. We'll work something out. Pavel Nikolaevich felt more cheerful. Whether or not they let him have his injections at home, his daughter's determination to move into the attack and get what she wanted filled him with pride. Aviette was leaning over him. And even without his glasses, he could see her honest, open face, ardent with energy and life. The quivering nostrils and the mobile eyebrows that trembled sensitively at every injustice. Was it Gorky who said, If your children are no better than you are, you have fathered them in vain. Indeed, you have lived in vain. Pavel Nikolaevich had not lived in vain. All the same, he was worried. Did she know about it? What would she say? In no hurry to bring the conversation around to the subject, she questioned him further about his treatment, asked what the doctors were like, checked his bedside table to see what he'd eaten, and replaced the food that had gone bad with fresh supplies. I have brought you some tonic wine, she said. Drink one liquor glass at a time. And some nice red caviar. You like that, don't you? And some lovely oranges from Moscow. That's nice. Meanwhile, she had been looking around the ward and its inmates. The upward jerk of her eyebrows showed how intolerably squalid she found it. Still, he thought one ought to look at it from the humorous point of view. Although no one else seemed to be listening, she leaned forward close to her father, and they began to speak, so that only the two of them could hear. Yes, I know, father, it's terrible. Aviat went straight to the point. It's common knowledge by now. Everyone in Moscow's talking about it. It can only be described as a massive review of legal proceedings. Massive is the word for it. It's like an epidemic. The pendulum swung right the other way. As if the wheel of history can even be turned back. Who could do it? Who dare? All right, granted it was a long time ago. They convicted those people, rightly or wrongly, and they sent them far away, into exile. But why bring them back now? Why transplant them back to their former lives? It's a painful, agonizing process. Above all, it's cruel to the exiles themselves. Some of them are dead. Why disturb their ghosts? Why raise groundless hopes among their relatives and perhaps a desire for revenge? Again, what does rehabilitated actually mean? It can't mean the man was completely innocent. He must have done something, however trivial. Ah, uh, she was such a clever girl. She had spoken with a passionate assurance that she was right. Although they hadn't yet mentioned his problem, Pavel Nikolaevich could see that his daughter would stand solidly behind him. Allah would never abandon him. But do you know of actual cases where people have come back, even to Moscow? Yes, even to Moscow, that's the point. They're all creeping back there like ants looking for sugar. 
and there are some terrible, tragic cases. Think of it. There was a man who'd been living in peace and quiet for years, and suddenly he was summoned to, you know where, to a confrontation. Can you imagine it? Pavel Nikolaevich grimaced as if he'd swallowed a lemon. Alla noticed, but she couldn't stop herself now. She always carried her train of thought to the finish. They told him to repeat what he'd said twenty years ago. Just think, who could possibly remember? What good would it do anyone? All right, if you've got a sudden urge to rehabilitate them, by all means, do so. But don't bring in confrontations. I mean, why shatter people's nerves? The man went home and very nearly hanged himself. Pavel Nikolaevich lay there in a hot sweat. That they might confront him face to face with Rodichev and Yelchansky or some other person was one possibility that had never occurred to him. Silly fools! Who made them sign those trumped-up confessions about themselves in the first place? They should have refused! Allah's flexible mind sized up the question from every angle. How can they stir up this hell? They should spare a thought for the people who were doing the job of work for society. How are they going to come out of all these upheavals? Did Mother tell you about... Yes, Father, she told me. But there's nothing for you to worry about. Her strong fingers gripped his shoulders. All right, I'll tell you what I think, if you like. A man who sends a signal is being politically conscious and progressive. He's motivated by the best intentions towards society. The people appreciates this and understands. There are cases where he may make a mistake. But the only people who never make mistakes are the ones who never do anything. Normally, a man is guided by his class instinct, and that never lets him down. Thank you, Allah, thank you. Pavel Nikolaevich felt tears welling up inside him, cleansing tears of release. You've put it well. The people appreciates, the people understands. It's just this stupid habit we've developed of regarding only those at the bottom of society as the people. His sweating hand stroked his daughter's cool one. It's very important for young people to understand us and not condemn. But tell me, what do they... But tell me, what do you think? Can they find a clause in the law by which we could be... I mean, by which I could be... Got for... Well, for giving incorrect evidence? Listen, Allah replied inanimately. I happened to be present at a conversation in Moscow where they were discussing, well, just this kind of unpleasant contingency. There was a lawyer present who explained that the law against so-called false evidence used to carry out a penalty of only two years, but that since then there have been two amnesties. It's out of the question to get someone on a charge of giving false evidence now. Rodichev won't utter a squeak. You can be sure of that. Pavel Nikolaevich felt as if even his tumor had ceased a little. That's my clever little girl, he said, happily relieved. You've always got the answer. You're always there at the right moment. You have given me back a lot of my strength. Taking one of his daughter's hands in both his own, he kissed it, reverently. Pavel Nikolaevich was an unselfish man. He always put his children's interests before his own. He knew he had no outstanding qualities except devotion to duty, thoroughness, and perseverance, but his daughter was his true achievement, and he basked in her light. Tired of holding the symbolic white coat, which kept slipping off her shoulders, she threw it with a laugh over the foot of the bed across her father's temperature chart. It wasn't the time of day when doctors or nurses came in. Allah was left in a new claret-colored sweater that he had never seen her in before, a broad white zigzag crossing it gaily from cuff to cuff, up the sleeves and across the breast. The bold zigzag went well with Allah's energetic movements. Her father had never grumbled if money was spent on dressing Allah well. They got things on the black market, from abroad, too, 
and all his clothes were confident and dashing, set off the sturdy, straightforward attractions that matched her direct, decisive mind. Listen, her father said quietly. Do you remember I asked you to find something out? That strange expression, you come across it sometimes in speeches or articles, the cult of personality. Are those words really an allusion to... I'm afraid they are, father. I'm afraid they are. Uh, so the cult of personality has an asterisk next to it. Uh, and next to that asterisk, the Soviet label now given to the negative criminal aspects of Stalinism. However, Stalin was also called the great successor to indicate his positive role as the successor of Lenin. So I guess the cult of personality would be the Soviet label now given to the negative criminal aspects of Stalinism. Okay. I'm afraid they are, Father. I'm afraid they are. At the Writers' Congress, for example, the phrase was used several times. And the trouble is, nobody explains what it means, though everyone puts on a face as if they understood. But it's pure blasphemy. How dare they? Ah! It's a shame and a disgrace. Somebody whispered it in the wind, and now it's blowing all over the place. But though they talk about the cult of personality, in the same breath they speak of the great successor. So one mustn't go too far in either direction. Generally speaking, you have to be flexible. You have to be responsive to the demand of the times. This may annoy you, father, but whether we like it or not, we have to attune ourselves to each new period, as it comes. I saw a lot in Moscow. I spent quite a bit of time in literary circles. Do you imagine it's been easy for writers to readjust their attitudes over these last two years? Very complicated. But what an experienced crowd they are. What tact. You can learn such a lot from them. During the quarter of an hour, Aviette had been sitting in front of him, rooting the grim monsters of the past and opening up vistas of the future with her brisk, precise comments. Pavel Nikolaevich had become visibly healthier. His spirits were now so improved that he no longer had any desire to talk about this tiresome tumor. There even seemed no point in making a fuss about his being transferred to another clinic. All he wanted to do was listen to his daughter's cheerful stories, to breathe the current of fresh air she brought with her. Go on, go on, he begged her. What's happening in Moscow? What was your journey like? Ah! Allah shook her head like a horse bothered by a gadfly. How can I describe Moscow? Moscow's a place you have to live in. Moscow's another world. A trip to Moscow is like going 50 years into the future. In the first place, everyone in Moscow sits around watching television. We'll soon have a television too. Soon, yes. But it won't be Moscow programs. Ours won't amount to much, you know. It's like something out of H.G. Wells. Everyone's sitting watching television. But there's more to it than that. I've got a general feeling, and I'm very quick at picking up what's in the air, that there's going to be a complete revolution in our way of life. I don't mean refrigerators and washing machines. Things are going to change much more drastically than that. For instance, here and there, you see lobbies made out of plate glass. and. They're putting low tables in the hotels, really low, this low, just like the Americans have. The first time you come across them, you don't know how to cope with them. Then lampshades made out of fabric, like the ones we have at home. They're something to be ashamed of now. They're vulgar. They have to be glass. And none of the beds have headboards. Headboards are out. It's all wide, low sofas and couches. They make the room look quite different. Our whole style of living is changing. You can't imagine what it's like. Mother and I have talked it over and we've agreed. There's a lot we're going to have to change. You can't buy things like that out here. Of course, you have to bring them from Moscow. But some of the fashions are really pernicious and 
ought to be condemned out of hand. Like, that rock and roll dance, it's absolutely debauched. I can't tell you what it's like. And those awful shaggy hairdos, deliberately in a mess, as if they just got out of bed. Kind of like mine. That's the West. They want to corrupt us. Of course, there's a complete lowering of moral standards, which is reflected in the arts. Take poetry, for instance. There's this long, lanky fellow, Yevdoshenko, a complete unknown, no rhyme or reason. All he has to do is wave his arms about and yell, and the girls go mad. Aviette was no longer talking privately, having switched to a public topic. She had raised her voice without restraint, so that everyone in the ward could hear her. Dayomka, however, was the only one to give up what he was doing to listen intently to her, momentarily distracted from the gnawing pain that was dragging him closer and closer to the operating table. The others either showed no interest or else weren't in the ward. Only Vadim Zatsirko occasionally lifted his eyes from the book he was reading to gaze at Aviette's back, curved like a great bridge tightly hugged by her sweater, which was too new to have lost its shape. It was claret-colored, all over, except for one shoulder which, caught by a sunbeam, glancing, reflected off of an open window, was rich crimson. Tell me some more about yourself. Well, father, I had an excellent trip to Moscow. They've promised they're going to include my collection of poems in their publishing plan, next year's program, of course, but one can't hope for anything earlier. Sooner than that would be unimaginably quick. Allah, do you really mean it? You mean in a year's time we'll actually have your poems in our hands? Well, maybe not a year or two, perhaps. His daughter had brought down an avalanche of joy on him today. He knew she'd taken her poems to Moscow, but from those typewritten sheets to a book with Alla Rosonova on the title page had seemed an impassably long distance. How did you manage it? Alla smiled back firmly. She was pleased with herself. Of course, she said, I could have just gone into the publishing house and produced my poems, but then I don't suppose anyone would have wasted time talking to me. But Anna Yevgenievna introduced me to M dash and then to S dash. I read them two or three poems. They both liked them. And then, well, they called up somebody and wrote to someone else. It was all quite simple. Wonderful. Pavel Nikolaevich was radiant. He rummaged in his bedside table for glasses and put them on, as though about to gaze admiringly at the precious book then and there. For the first time in his life, Dayomka had seen a real, live poet. And not just a poet, but a poetess. His jaw dropped. I've got such a nice name for a poet, too. It's a good, clean, ringing name. I won't use a pseudonym. What's more, I feel I really look like a writer. Allah, but what if it doesn't work out? You realize, don't you, you'll have to write up every little nobody so that he can be recognized by his friends. No, I've got an idea. I'm not going to worry about every individual character. There's no need for that. What I have in mind is something completely new. I'll go straight to the collective. I'll portray whole collectives with broad strokes. After all, one's whole life is bound up with the collective, not with isolated personalities. Yes, that's true enough, Pavel Nikolaevich had to admit. But there was a hazard which his daughter, in her enthusiasm, might not appreciate. But have you considered this? The critics may start in on you, you know. In our world, criticism is a kind of social reproach. It's dangerous. Aviette tossed back her dark brown locks, and, fearless as an Amazon, gazed into the future. The fact is, she said, they'll never be able to criticize me very seriously because there will be no ideological mistakes in my work. If they attack me from the artistic point of view, well, heaven's alive, who don't they attack for that? 
Take the case of Babayevsky. At first, everyone loved him. Then everyone hated him. They all renounced him, even his most faithful friends. But that's only a temporary phase. They'll change their minds. They'll come back to him. It's just one of those delicate transitions life's so full of. For instance, they used to say, there must be no conflict. But now they talk about the false theory of absence of conflict. If there was a division of opinion, if some people were still talking the old way while others were using the new style, then it would be obvious that there had been a change. But when everyone starts talking the new way all at once, you don't notice there's been a transition at all. What I say is, the vital thing is to have tact and be responsive to the times. Then you won't get in trouble with the critics. Oh yes, you asked me for some books, father. I brought you some. You ought to do some reading now. You don't have time, usually. I've had a good look at the sort of life writers lead. They have such delightfully simple relationships with each other. They may be Stalin Prize winners, but they're all on first-name terms. They're such unconceited, straightforward people. We imagine a writer as someone sitting up in the clouds with a pallid brow, unapproachable. Not a bit of it. They enjoy the pleasures of life. They tease each other the whole time. There's plenty of laughter. I should call their life a merry one. But when the time comes to write a novel, they lock themselves away in their houses in the country for two or three months. And there's your novel. Yes, I'm going to put every ounce of energy into getting into the writer's union. You mean, you're not going to use your university qualifications to work professionally? Pavel Nikolaevich was rather worried. Father, Aviat lowered her voice. What sort of life does a journalist have? They give you an assignment. Do this, do that. You've got no scope. All you do is go and interview various well-known personalities. You can't compare that life with the other. Bravo! Because it pays. Allah, whatever you say, I'm still a bit worried. Suppose it doesn't work out. How can it fail to work out? You're being naive. Gorky said anyone can become a writer. With hard work, anyone can achieve anything. If the worst comes to worst, I can become a children's writer. All right, that's fine in principle, said Pavel Nikolaevich thoughtfully. In principle, that's splendid, of course. It's perfectly right for morally healthy people like you to take over literature. She began to take some books out of her bag. I've brought you a Baltic spring and kill him. That one's poetry, I'm afraid. Will you read it? Kill him? All right, leave it. Our dawn is already here. Light over the earth. Toilers for peace. Mountains in bloom. Wait a minute. Mountains in bloom. I think I've read that one. You read the earth in bloom. This is mountains in bloom. Here's another one. Youth is with us. That's a must. You'd better start with it. Even the titles make you feel good. I chose them with that in mind. Didn't you bring anything with a bit of sentiment in it? Sentiment? No, father. I thought, in the sort of mood you were in... I know enough already about books like these, Pavel Nikolaevich waved a couple of fingers at the pile. But please, can't you find me something that appeals to the heart? All right, said Aviat, pondering. I'll give Dumas, la reine Margat, to mother to bring when she comes. That's just what I need. She was getting ready to go. Meanwhile, Dayomko was sitting frowning in his corner, in torment, either from the unceasing pain in his leg, or else from shyness at the thought of entering into conversation with this dazzling girl, who was also a poetress. Finally, he plucked up enough courage to ask his question without clearing his throat or coughing in mid sentence. Excuse me he said. Can you tell me, please, what you think about the need for sincerity in literature? Asterisk next to the sentence. The discussion which follows hinges on Vladimir Pomerantsev's article, 
in the December 1953 edition of Novi Mirror, attacked at the time by Communist Party press, it turned out to be the first indication of the coming thaw. What's that? What did you say? At once, Aviat turned toward him with a regal half-smile, for the hoarseness of Dionka's voice had told her clearly how shy he was. That wretched sincerity again. It's wormed its way in here, too, has it? She looked into Dionka's face. Obviously, the boy was quite uneducated and not very intelligent. She didn't really have the time, but it wouldn't do to leave him under such a bad influence. Listen, my boy, she announced in powerful, ringing tones, as though speaking from a platform. Sincerity can't be the chief criterion for judging a book. If an author expresses incorrect ideas or alien attitudes, the fact that he's sincere about them merely increases the harm the work does. Sincerity becomes harmful. Subjective sincerity can militate against a truthful presentation of life. That's a dialectical point. Do you understand? Dionka found it hard to absorb ideas. He furrowed his brow. Not quite, he said. All right, then, I'll explain. Aviat spread her arms. The white zigzag on her sweater, flashing like lightning from arm to arm across her chest. It's the easiest thing in the world to take some depressing fact and describe it just as it is. What one should do, though, is plow deep to reveal the seedlings, which are the plants of the future. Otherwise, they can't be seen. But seedlings... What's that? Seedlings have to sprout by themselves. Dionka hurried to get his word in. If you plow seedlings over, they won't grow. Yes, I know, but we're not talking about agriculture, my boy, are we? Telling people the truth doesn't mean telling them the bad things, harping on our shortcomings. On the other hand, one may describe the good things quite fearlessly, so as to make them even better. Where does this false demand for so-called harsh truth come from? Why does truth suddenly have to be harsh? Why can't it be radiant, uplifting, optimistic? Our literature ought to be wholly festive. When you think about it, it's an insult to people to write gloomily about their life. They want life to be decorated and embellished. I agree with that. Generally speaking, came a pleasant, clear voice from behind her. True. Why spread depression? Of course, the last thing Aviat needed was an ally. But she was confident of her luck. If anyone spoke up, it was always on her side. She turned toward the window, and the white zigzag flashed in the sunbeam. A young man of her own age, with an expressive face, was tapping the end of a black, fluted mechanical pencil against his teeth. What exactly is literature for? He was thinking aloud, perhaps for Dionka's benefit, or perhaps for Allah's. Literature is to divert us when we are in a bad mood. Literature is the teacher of life, muttered Dionka, blushing at the awkwardness of his remark. Vadim tilted his head right back. Teacher, my foot, he said. We manage somehow to sort our lives out without it. You're not implying that writers are any cleverer than us practical workers, are you? He and Allah exchanged glances. They recognized that they were two of a kind. Although they were the same age and could not help liking each other's looks, each was too firmly set on a definite path to see, in a chance exchange of glances, the beginning of an adventure. The role of literature in life is generally greatly exaggerated, Vadim was arguing. Books are sometimes praised to the skies when they don't deserve it. Take Gargantua and Pantagruel. If you hadn't read it, you'd think it was something tremendous. But read it, and it turns out to be nothing but an obscenity and a waste of time. Eroticism has its place in literature even in books by contemporary writers, said Aviette, objecting strongly. It's not necessarily superfluous. Combined with really progressive ideological thinking, it adds a certain richness, 
of flavor. For example, in It is superfluous, Vadim retorted with conviction. It's not the function of the printed word to tickle the passions. Stimulants can be bought at the pharmacists. Without giving the Amazon in the claret-colored sweater another glance, or waiting for her to convince him to the contrary, he lowered his eyes to his book. It always upset Aviette when people's ideas failed to fall into one of two clear-cut categories, the soundly argued and the unsoundly argued. She hated it when they ranged vaguely through all the shades of the spectrum. It only led to ideological confusion. Right now, she couldn't make out whether this young man was for her or against her. Ought she to argue with him or let it go at that? She let it go. Now, my boy, she said, turning back to Dionka to finish with him, you must understand this. Describing something that exists is much easier than describing something that doesn't exist, even though you know it's going to exist. What we see today with the unaided human eye is not necessarily the truth. The truth is what we must be, what is going to happen tomorrow. Our wonderful tomorrow is what writers ought to be describing today. But what will they describe tomorrow, then? The slow-witted Dayomga frowned. Tomorrow? Well, tomorrow they'll describe the day after tomorrow. The young man must be a bit weak in the head. It wasn't worth wasting her arguments on him. However, Aviette wound up, the article was extremely harmful. It groundlessly and insultingly accused writers of insincerity. Only a Philistine could treat writers with such disrespect. What matters is that writers should be appreciated for what they are, honest toilers. It's only Western writers who can be accused of insincerity because they are mercenary. If they weren't, nobody would buy their books. Everything depends on money over there. She got up and was standing in the aisle now, the strong, sturdy, good-looking daughter of Rusonov. Pavel Nikolaevich had been listening with pleasure throughout the lecture she'd just given Dionka. She had kissed her father, and now she raised her hand, fingers spread to give him a cheerful wave. Fight for your health, Daddy, she said. Fight hard. Go on with the treatment and get rid of your tumor, and don't worry about anything. She emphasized the word, everything's going to be all right. Everything. That concludes chapter 21 of Cancer Ward and part one of the book. There are two parts, apparently. Actually, you know what? There's probably three parts. I finished that one just in time because I'm looking at the Instagram right now and there's 35 seconds remaining. So what I will say in this 35 seconds is... I think that was supposed to be her. There is no, like, if I mess up, if I, <laughs> just a side note to try and tell you how tough this is. There is no, like, attribution to any of these people. If you fuck up once, then, uh, you're off. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, and later.